All right, cameraman Wes. Yeah. Obviously, we are not. We are not in the normal studio. We are kind of an <laughs> on-location podcast. It's kind of cool. We don't get to do this too often. Right. Um, we're up here at. Uh, is it a bait or is it a bait? I don't know. I've always known it as a bait, but I've heard it said both ways. Yeah, I don't know. We're going to find out. We're yeah. going to find out today for sure. Yeah. Uh, Wes, tell me a little bit about this badass beard care. Came on board with the sponsors. Badass beard care. Uh, I get, it's an American-made product. It's a veteran-owned company. Uh, the product is amazing. I'll tell you that because I, I, I use it every day anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually have a scent that I want to get. Uh, oh, Havana something. But it's like coconut, tobacco, uh, stuff like that. I really want to try that one. Uh, <laughs> so, that's how they get you. You know, they keep coming out with different, right. different scents <laughs> right. and stuff. Yeah, that's how they get you. But uh, no, they it's an amazing company. Um, like I said their product is is really good. The Chuck's Hogwash, uh, I don't know what they put in it, but it makes your beard fuller, uh, darker. Like it's it's really good stuff. It is good stuff. I've enjoyed it. I again, I'm not going to promote anything I won't use myself. Mm -hmm. I, it has now become my daily beard care regimen and everything else too. So I, I agree a hundred percent. Right. So Wesley, who who you got lined up for us today? Well, as you can tell, we are not at the studio. This is a bait, a bait, <laughs> their office in Bargersville, Indiana. And we're going to be talking with a special guest today, Jay. And I've, been, I've looked traditional forward. Traditional spelling. Yes, traditional spelling. <laughs> I've really looked forward to this one only because I think it will help people understand what a bait does. Yeah. Because a lot of people just think, you know, it's the boogie, it's the big party. It's like, that's where they get their money from. But they do so much more. They go up to the state house. They they're for the bikers, making sure the laws are in place. And I can't wait to hear what he has to say about all that and how they do right. all that, because this 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 place means so much more to people than what they really understand. No, I, I think I agree a hundred percent, a hundred percent with that. Yeah, there's just so much to it. There's so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, what do you say we uh, go see if we can find him and yeah. uh, get him in here? All right, let's go. All right, man. Well, Jay, I am here in the Bargersville office of Abate of Indiana. I say Abate. Some say Abate. I got to ask you, what is the official enunciation? There's no wrong pronunciation, Scott. Uh, I I've heard Abate, which I guess is the French version. I don't know. Um, oh, some oh, people read Alfred. it and they just they want to put too much into it. Uh, I think if you look at the at Webster's. Uh, you look at like tax abatements, it's a bait. And originally that's what the acronym uh, kind of meant to do. You know, we wanted to uh, do away with mm -hmm. uh, some of the federal restrictions on right. motorcyclists. And that's, you know, back in the uh, early 1970s. So that's okay. where the, the name came from. I say abate of Indiana. Uh, seems the further south you get in the state, abate is uh, more prevalent. But uh, like I said, we don't, we don't differentiate. We're here for all bikers, all riders. You can call us whatever you want, as long as it's not late for dinner, right? You know, it's kind of like, you know, I moved from, from Long Island, New York in 1971. I was 10 years old, moved from Long Island, New York to Atlanta, Georgia. Now, first of all, culture-wise, 1971, Atlanta, Georgia, totally different than what Atlanta, Georgia is now. Um, but, you know, I went down there and it's kind of like, you know, if, if I use the word, like, like I say fire. Down there, it's far. You know, if, if you get put oil, you know, hey, did you check the oil in the car? It's not oil, it's all. Tars. So put some tars, tars on the car. I got tars. And so, yeah. It's like it's watching just, a NASCAR race. Dude, I'm telling you. Dude, I moved down there, and I mean, Uneasy Rider had just come out, right? Charlie Daniels. Mm -hmm. was, dude, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. I didn't understand any of the words of that song or nothing. I had them all out there stiffing and fetching. <laughs> like their heads were on par and their asses catching. I was like... I have no idea why why the donkey was in the kitchen. I don't even know that one. I ain't either. even got a garage. You can call home and ask my <laughs> That's wife. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, all right, man. But so, it, it so is Indiana say... where we have uh, Du Bois County in Versailles, which, uh, again, you go overseas, and they would pronounce those a lot different. Right, so. right. What is it they say about Indiana? Uh, where North Vernon is south, South Bend is north, and French Lick ain't nothing like it sounds. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is very mm-hmm. good. So before we even get started, let me just ask you this. All right, so we know we can pronounce it either way. We'll, we'll answer it anyway. What was the other one you said? Uh, abate. 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 That's going to be yeah. my new one. Um, what, what, and Kate, you're Jay Jackson. You are, what is your official title? Executive director. Executive director of Abate of Indiana. Mm-hmm. Abate of Indiana. All of those. Abate. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, I, you know, because I always, I always forget what, what is your actual title? I mean, obviously, I've known you for a long time. Um, I worked in this little town for many, many, many years, long before the show. Um, how long have you been doing this? Um, I got involved with the organization in 1982. Okay. Um, became a county officer uh, pretty much immediately, about 1983. Uh, had some regional titles. That's the way our organization is structured. And uh, got involved in our writer education program in 1985-86. Um, became an instructor, became a site coordinator, then in 1995, the state director of motorcycle safety for Abate of Indiana, uh, Charlie Hennard, held that position at the time, had been here a few years. He said, you know, I need to go do some things. Why don't you take this gig? I said, well, you know, I have a job. Uh, I, was, I was doing pretty well at the time and <laughs> didn't really, you know, I was doing this as a, a passion and volunteer type work, but didn't really need the job. Mm-hmm. And uh We talked about it a bit, and I talked with my uh, employer at the time, and uh, he encouraged me to to go for it. So I took what I thought was about a three-year sabbatical from my real job in real life, and uh, after six years, my employer quit calling to ask when I was coming back. (laughs) So then in uh, 2001, I became the executive director, and I've been in that position uh, since then. All right, so 23 years now. Now, I was going to say, because I moved to Indiana in 87. Um, but I didn't really start riding again. I was one of those guys. I took a hi- hiatus from motorcycling. I sold my bike when I when when my wife and I moved from Atlanta, Georgia. We sold the motorcycle, got up here. We had a one year old daughter, and shortly after we got up here, we found out you know we were getting ready to have another child. And so the thought of a motorcycle just didn't enter my mind. And in all honesty, even if I wanted one, I couldn't have afforded one then anyway with little kids on the way. So we've certainly heard that before, haven't we? You know, yeah. life gets in the way and something yeah. has to give for a while and then folks come back. So 12 years I went without, without doing uh, any motorcycling other than borrowing friends. I, I'd borrow friends, motorcycles and stuff. And uh, so, you know, I did what I could do and uh, until the time finally came and it was 2000 when I finally I guess it was 98, a, a buddy of mine, a pastor, a friend of mine, he had a, a, an old 82 uh, Sportster and he wasn't able to ride anymore and stuff like that. So I, I kept his bike for two years. Back those days, you had to wait two years for, if you bought a new Harley, it took two years for a new Harley. To come I remember out. those days. So that's what I did. And uh, I waited because I knew I couldn't afford it, but I knew I'd be able to sell it right away if I couldn't afford it. So, um, you know, it, it worked out. I'm still riding the same motorcycle now. Here we were, you know, from 2000 all the way here, 2024. I'm still riding the same motorcycle. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think. So I started back in 2000. So basically, the same time you became executive director. About that same area, yeah. So it's, uh, you, you've, been, you've been doing this longer, longer than I've even been in the state of Indiana. Um, and that's, what I, I, that's something I've been wanting to ask. I know it's called Abate of Indiana. <laughs> Um, um, that, that leads me to believe there's other states that have the same program. Absolutely. Um, abate is an acronym. I was going to say, what for, does abate stand for? Uh, the one we recognize in abate of Indiana is American bikers aimed toward education. Uh, it's a more positive spin. The original, uh, because originally back in the earliest 1970s, um, abate was started by easy rider magazine and it was going to be a national organization found out it really didn't work that well and it, it was going to be better if they let states sort of get involved and start things up on their own. So that was only about a year and a half that they tried that and then it went to states. But the original acronym, uh, ABATE, was a Brotherhood Against Totalitarian Enactments. And at that time, the uh, motorcyclist rights movement was all about fighting the helmet law. Uh, certainly, ABATE of Indiana and the state motorcyclist rights organizations around the country 
believe in freedom of choice for riders to mm-hmm. you know choose what they want, but we've evolved far beyond just being a helmet law right. uh, situation. And just to clarify for any of the folks uh, listening in, um, we are not anti-helmet. We're anti-helmet law. Uh, you know, we want the choice. Yes. Uh, we want riders to be educated so they make the proper decisions, and rather than just being forced to put any helmet on their head, actually learn about how to choose what helmet is going to work best for them, make the most comfortable, provide the best fit, the best protection, the best value, all that stuff. So if there were a, a bill introduced that would prohibit the use of helmets, we'd oppose that as well. Right. Because <laughs> we want the riders to be able to make that choice and an informed yeah. decision. But uh, yeah, there, there are state motorcyclist rights organizations, SMROs, uh, across the country. I don't believe there's a state that does not have one. Uh, and probably about 80% of them have the word abate in them somewhere. Okay. Uh, they can twist that up a little, uh, how they spell out the acronym. Uh, for instance, in Alaska, I think it's uh, Alaska Bikers Aim Toward Education. So they get to shake it up a little gotcha. and uh, some subtle variations, but uh, we're all autonomous, all individual independent. Uh, we get together frequently. Actually, uh, Mike Fairball, Balls, mm-hmm. who was... Uh, uh, instrumental in the, the building of a bait back in the <clears throat> uh, early mid seventies and certainly into our, our heyday in the eighties uh, recognized in, I believe it was 1985, 84, 85. Uh, he was getting a lot of phone calls because a bait of Indiana has always been aggressive, progressive and successful. So these other rights organizations around the country had questions. How do you do this? Where do you find that? How, who'd you talk to to make this happen? And so Balls found himself on the phone a lot with other states talking about stuff and said, you know, we ought to just get together and and share things. So the uh, first Meeting of the Minds conference was held in St. Louis, and I think there were about 20 states represented at that meeting. And that has evolved into an annual conference now in our, well, do the math. I can't. I'm not going to take my shoes off to figure (laughs) it out, but I think we're nearing our our 40th anniversary. I think, well, this should be our 30th. What have we been, 84, 94? I don't know. We've got an anniversary this year, and we're holding it in St. Louis again. But that was the beginnings of the Motorcycle Riders Foundation, which is basically an, an association of all the state motorcyclist rights organizations around the country. So just about every state has one of okay. some type. Some have two. And that was the other thing I was going to ask is, is do you guys, because that was the question, do you guys ever get together? And I, I just remember um, like a Harley Owners Group, HOG. They used to have, you know, every state did their own HOG rally. Right. And then they would have one national rally and it would be hosted in whatever city, you know what I mean? And uh, ha- has Abate ever thought about doing something like that? Doing a, uh, you know, a bait in other states and, or you know, some type of a rally where Abate members would all. We do that actually a couple times a year. The event I just spoke of, the, the Meeting of the Minds conference, uh, where it is truly that, a gathering to network and share ideas about what works, what doesn't work, whether that's with regards to rider education or motorcycle safety, uh, legislative activity, membership, uh, you know, services, just uh, logistics of running an organization. All those things are discussed at that conference. And then uh, the Motorcycle Riders Foundation, that same group, I just got back from Washington. Uh, Every spring, we host a Bikers Inside the Beltway event, and that is our national grassroots lobby day. So we had bikers from all over the country come into Washington uh, to walk the halls of Congress and knock on doors and talk to their uh, representatives, uh, the congressional delegation from their states. We hit, uh, I think we had this year, I think we had 42 states represented in Washington. Um, We made sure that every office on Capitol Hill got got visited. So 535 offices were visited in one day. Uh, some of those were just drop-offs from folks from other states, but mm-hmm. a lot of those were uh, extended personal visits talking about the legislative agenda that's important to motorcyclists, which if you want to get into that, that's almost a whole podcast on its own, but <laughs> we can hit some of that in a bit if you want. But yeah. uh, it was a very successful day and uh, uh, influenced a lot of the lawmakers in D.C., which is the intent of the event. Yeah. Well, and that's I guess that kind of leads me to the next question. I, when I think about what you guys do, um, I think about... Uh, you know, the day at the state house here mm-hmm. in Indiana. And again, I'm, I'm kind of going more regional now to, to us, a bait of Indiana. I know you guys do a, the, the state house thing here. I know you guys have the, the writer's education program where people learn to ride. I know my wife, every one of my children, 
every one of my children's friends, everybody. I put so many people through your guys' organization, um, through your writing course, because it was it was so good for my wife. And I watched how my wife changed from not wanting to really ride her own bike to crap, I gotta buy another motorcycle. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh careful what you ask for, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I do, I wonder, you know, what is what is the main do, do you have a main focus? as far as what is the primary function? Is it the legislation part? Is it the rider safety part? Is it uh, making sure the boogie is the best damn party you're gonna go to for the year? Uh, The answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's the culmination of all those things. Um, One component that you left out that's important to a lot of our people, uh, we started this again back in the late 70s and, and got real strong in the early 80s, is our philanthropic activity. Um, we just saw you the other day at the Miracle Ride, a benefit fundraiser for Riley Hospital for Children, a 30th year of that event. All right. Um, regrettably, it looks like it's going to be the final big ride, but uh, there's still some things in place to make sure that uh, giving continues to happen. But um, the Miracle Ride in its life has uh, contributed more than $7 million to Riley Hospital for Children. Uh, when we were doing, uh, we had a relationship for a number of years with the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Uh, back through most of the 1980s. And during our tenure with them, we contributed, I think, about $4.5 million uh, to MDA. And then, uh, you know, countless local, uh, state, national charities uh, just helping out a little, some small, some big. And a lot of our people are really involved in that. So that uh, is one of the public faces that we have and one of the things that we do uh, in helping people. Uh, probably our most public, at least in in my mind, is our rider education program. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're over 140,000 people that we've trained in that program now. Nice. Um, a lot of folks have been touched, like you say, and it's it's so rewarding. You know, I hate to keep using this, but I, I paraphrase the old Peace Corps uh, motto from the 1970s: "It's the toughest job you'll ever love," mm-hmm. because it is. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of commitment for our instructors. Uh, they go through about 100 hours of training to be ready to do that. And then on weekends when it'd be a lot more fun to just be out riding, right. they're out on a parking lot sharing that with, with new riders. Um, and not only new riders, as you're well aware, uh, we have people that take it repeatedly. And, mm-hmm. you know, experienced riders that take the entry-level course just because every time they come back, it's with a little different perspective and they pick up on something. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, education and training is kind of like money. You, get, you can't have too much. Right. So it's, it's always good. But that uh, likely is our most public face, what people know. Uh, people often just call it the abate course, you know, that's because that's how they think of it. That's, um, well, I, that's all I've ever called it. <laughs> and and so we, we've got a lot of folks that look at us uh, in that light. Certainly our legislative activity is what started the organization and the entire motorcycle strikes movement. So we have a, um, a strong presence at the state house. And as I said, we also work with the MRF in Washington, D.C., Because we need to make sure that, you know, there's not some federal law that supersedes or, you know, overshadows the the ability to home rule. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a federal mandate on X, Y, Z, doesn't matter what the state wants to do, they're they're restricted and bound by that. So we want to make sure that the state has the right to do that and the ability to do that. That's why we spend so much time in Washington. But uh, I'm a registered lobbyist. I spend a lot of time at the state house uh, working on anything that is positive for motorcycling. And if there's something that's detrimental to motorcycling, we're going to oppose that. And uh, uh, Rod Taylor, our attorney, once said, you know, it, it seems like everything's just going so smooth. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. And we somehow struck on the analogy of a duck. Because, you know, when you look at a duck floating across the water, it just looks so peaceful and serene and like he's floating. But under the water, he's working it pretty hard. You know? So behind the scenes... Right. There's a lot going on to make it look like there's nothing going on. <laughs> so there's a lot of legislation that gets introduced, or at least uh, introduced doesn't mean much. It means they write it on paper and, and say, I'd like to do this. Doesn't mean it goes anywhere because, gotcha. as you know, the process and the House, the Speaker gets to sign those bills and he can assign them to a committee where they're never going to get heard and it'll just die there. Uh, but bills are introduced all the time that could have dramatic effects on motorcycling. And oftentimes we're able to nip those before they even, you know, get a hearing and kill them before they happen. Yeah. And folks don't ever hear about that. And that's 
One of the problems we probably have right now is we're kind of a victim of our own success where our people have done such a good job working so hard uh, to make it look like there are no threats that a lot of writers just don't think there's a problem. And, you know, we're actually looking at some of the greatest threats to motorcycling in the history of, of the, the sport, the machine, the transportation, the lifestyle uh, with things like, you know, autonomous vehicles and how we fit there. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, we could do a whole episode on autonomous and electrics and all that stuff. But the future of motorcycling, you, you know, we don't want to be the sky is falling and be fear mongers, but we got to pay attention because there are a number of folks who would just as soon see motorcycles locked up in museums and put on racetracks, not out on the street. Yeah. So we've got to work really hard to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we've got the... Uh, the philanthropic activity, the rider education, the legislation, and of course, there is the parties. Mm -hmm. uh, it's we're a social organization as well. Uh, yep. Folks have a good time. We have a lot of events, a couple hundred events a year statewide, scattered throughout fourteen regions. Uh, parties, swap meets, rides, runs, you name it, right. and, and we got one. And that's what I was going to ask you. How many? There's, so there's fourteen. Fourteen regions. Regions in mm -hmm. Indiana. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I know. I was part of 11 for a long, 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 mm -hmm. long time. Um, uh, it's just, to me, and, and again, you know, and, and people talk about the party part of it. It's like, you know, I've heard the, old, the expression, all work, no play, make somebody mm -hmm. a dull boy. You know what I mean? And it's like, I, my philosophy in life is I work hard. I want to play hard. I want to, if I'm, I'm going to. I don't mind it. doing all this work, but boy, when it's time for me to have a good time, I plan on having a good time. I don't plan on, you know what I mean? And there's a time and place for everything. And there, there comes a time where it's like, dear Lord, if I don't, if I don't get a chance to get away, you know what I mean? You know, something like the boogie where I'm going to get away for a few days and I can just get away from my normal, go into whatever situation I want to get into. Um, cause I'm going to, I want to talk about that just a little bit here later on. Um, because what you guys have now is there's so much room. You can have anything from a quiet weekend mm -hmm. to the craziest weekend you've ever experienced in your entire life. And Pick everything. what you want. And so um, the party, is, is it's important. That part of it is important. You, you've got to be able to smile. You've got to be able to laugh. You've got to be able to get a break from the monotony and the and the, the garbage that we call life. You know it's still I mean? a word that makes it all worthwhile, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Um I was going to say this for last, but you kind of touched on it already, talking about different legislation coming in. Something I find uh, with Steel Horse Thunder, we, we spend a lot of time doing the, the charity ride stuff. You know, we spend a lot of time around, whether it's something like the Miracle Ride, where, you know, there, there's back in the day, there was thousands upon thousands of motorcycles coming out for it. And um, whether it's those kind of big giant rides, uh, the governor's ride, mm -hmm. uh, you know, back when Mitch Daniels was here and he, even, uh, through Mike the Pence, Pence administration, mm -hmm. you know, um, Mike Pence. And I just got to say this, and I don't care what everybody's political views are. This has nothing to do with politics. I thought it was super cool when Mike Pence became our governor and he was like, you know what, Mitch Daniels, who was an avid motorcyclist mm -hmm. when he, you know, eight years and he had that governor's ride. And then Mike Pence was like, you know what, I want to, I want to keep this going and was able to, and he may, I think, I think he told me he had, he had wrote a little bit when he was younger, but did he not go through your guys' course to get, he did. To get, he did. His, to get mm -hmm. his endorsement and everything else on his license? And whether you like, like the guy or hate the guy, I thought that, was, that part of it, I thought was pretty darn cool. Well, and as but, you said, without making it about uh, politics, we can talk about legislation because that's not really the individual or the party. That's what they do for motorcyclists. Exactly. So, you know, I, I don't vote Republican. I don't vote Democrat. <laughs> right. I vote motorcycle. Right. So, you know, whatever their positions are on some of these other social issues, that's not my problem. Exactly. It, during the Daniels administration, uh, can I tell a story? Sure. Okay. During the Daniels administration, um, I'd get a lot of Monday morning phone calls because remember that was right to work happened during that administration. And so uh, organized labor was not in favor of that. And obviously we have a lot of members that are union folks. And so every Monday morning, I'd get some <laughs> phone call, and they'd use his whole name, goddamn Mitch Daniels, um, <laughs> complaining. And I, I would say, you know, I, I understand and appreciate your concern from that perspective, <laughs> but you need to call your union BA or something and talk about that. Because from a motorcycling perspective, 
and that's our focus. This guy is doing some really solid stuff for us. Mm -hmm. And we've been fortunate that we've had uh, great relationships with uh, most administrations and state government and uh, yeah. some better than others, but uh, able to work with them and, and get things accomplished that benefit all motorcyclists. And like I said, you don't have to like them on some of these other issues, but right. as long as they're with us on motorcycling, we'll, we'll work with them. Exactly. But then that was my thing. You know, we, we had some big rides. I, we cover a lot of small rides. There, there could be 10 bikes show up because, you know, little Amy, you know, mm -hmm. was born with a birth defect and they need some help. And so, you know, it may have only been 10 people show up or 20 people show up for it. But, you know, we cover all that stuff. Um, the one thing I have noticed, uh, we are starting season 12. This is my 13th season doing the show. And I can tell you from 13 years ago to where we're at now, the amount of motorcycles. And, and it's hard to judge only because back, in, back 13 years ago, you had one charity ride every three or four weeks yeah. and that was it now you have 10 to 15 charity rides every weekend so the rides are obviously smaller because you have everybody you know people are so spread out now so you don't have as many but i've always said i look around and everybody's my age you know what i mean and i and i and i've always said it in the church and i say it in this it's like if we don't bring the younger people on board where are we going to be 10 20 years from now now you've been with preaching to the choir, my friend. You've been preaching to the choir for thirty plus years. You've you've seen it from way back to where it is now. Where do you see it going? Where do you see abate twenty years from now? Where do where where do you see what? Well, it's scary, Scott. It, it really is. And uh, you've touched on a handful of uh, components of that discussion. Uh, I'll try to address them. Um, the average age of a motorcyclist over the last 30 years has increased by 30 years. Hmm. You're, it's the same group mm -hmm. of people getting older. I mean, there are a few younger new folks that come in, but predominantly it's that same group aging. Um, if something doesn't happen on the, the back end of that, we're all just going to fall off the cliff and there are going to be no motorcyclists. So that's, that's very concerning to us. And that's why we are uh, so involved in off-road. Uh, you know, try to get yes. kids and families involved. So from a young age, they start thinking about motorcycling. Uh, we've got a dirt bike school where we can enroll kids as young as six years old, uh, train them in safe wow. operation of an off-road machine. Um, the 400-acre park, Lawrence County Recreational Park, where families can go and safely recreate and have a good time. The Tiny Tots experience mm -hmm. that uh, you've seen before, part of the Bait of Indiana's Children's Motorcycling Adventure. That's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it's designed to try to get kids involved. And um, we don't teach kids in the Tiny Tots. Uh, that's just a riding experience mm -hmm. where they, they get a chance to be in control and operate a real live motorcycle, hopefully for the first time, and experience what it's like. And I'm not really sure who gets more out of it, the kids or the parents. Right. Because, I mean, the parents just, I mean, you see them light up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I know that we've gotten a lot. We can't track it, really. But I know that we've gotten a lot of families and kids involved that way. And that, that's our hope, is to create the next generation of motorcyclists so that this doesn't die with us. That's, um, that's what scares me more than anything. Oh, it and is. And it's like, and, and, you know, you and I, we're, we're, we're fairly close to the same age, I would think. Um, you're 30, because I'm, I'm 30. You're 30? Okay, yeah. I'm, 30. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm two years older. That's, that's, that's not bad. Um, but, you know, like everybody in my generation, we, we didn't have the luxury of having any kind of riding course. We learned you got on your motorcycle, and you were out in the woods, and you were on a little... You fell three, down a couple times? Three horsepower, mm -hmm. rump sprint, little mini bike. You pulled a rope, and you, you took off, and after you hit a tree a time or two, you stopped hitting trees. And then, you know what I mean? And But we all learned on... The dirt we learned off road and then eventually we got old enough to where we could start riding on the streets and uh, i know i've gone down to the lawrence county park and we've been we've done some filming down there when the kids are down there racing and and doing doing their stuff and the, the trail runs and all that and that was my whole purpose for doing that it's like my god if we don't reach the kids again i i, I spent a lot of time in the church and i'd watch the older people get ticked off when the long haired would come walking into church or they came in in their blue jeans and their t-shirts, you know, you know, I mean, but without them, there's no future. It's like, what are you going to do? Yeah. Man? Look at, look at, look around. All you old people are going to die. I mean, you've read the Bible, you know, you're going to die. There's only one, there's only one that's undefeated. And that's mm -hmm. father time himself. 
everybody's gonna gonna go and it's like what's gonna happen you don't want none of these people coming in here well he's got long hair he's got a Led Zeppelin t-shirt on you know what I mean and it's like who cares <laughs> and so that's kind of where I see the the motorcycling it's like I see some of the super old school people that lash out at me when I test ride a, an electric motorcycle <laughs> or when I do something that's not conventional and it's like dude the future's coming like it or not the future's coming and you better you better prepare for it. You better be bringing somebody along. And if I want to spend time with the children, it's because I want to make sure we have somebody following us that when we're gone, somebody else is coming around to help somebody with a charity ride or whatever. Isn't that uh, the, the true meaning of a legacy? You know, making sure that it continues. Right. If it just dies with you, there's there's nothing going on. It's, it's a wasted effort. So I think most people would want it to continue. But, Scott, we've been fighting that. Uh, Abate of Indiana will turn 50 years old in June of 2025. So a little over a year from now, we'll be 50 years old. And for 50 years, we've been fighting some of that uh, battling within type stuff. Mm -hmm. You know the motorcycling culture as well as I do. And um, how is it explained to me? A friend of mine some 40 years ago explained this. He said, um, Harley riders will talk to anybody. Goldwing Road Riders will talk with other Goldwing Road Riders, and BMW Riders speak exclusively to God. And it was a joke, of course, but right. there, there are factions and segments and sectors that it's, it's silly, and the rights movement has battled that forever because, you know, people puff up about brands or Scott. I rode a sportster for a number of years, got beat up by Harley guys. You know, right. half a Harley. Uh, <laughs> right. Come on. So it doesn't matter what you ride. I, I, I think I've heard this somewhere before. Probably. It doesn't matter time, what dude. you ride. It's that you ride. Yeah. So um, obviously we're all about that. That's not to say that somewhere along the line you're not going to get hopefully some good natured uh, right. ribbing or elbowing about, you know, something about your bike. Uh, I get it. We all get it. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't always help us, though. You know, so you guys listening, <laughs> try to take it easy, especially on new folks. Don't scare them away. We want them to get excited. And uh, maybe they'll, you know, adopt your mindset someday anyway. But we are all riders. And uh, like you, we've got to be careful because the aberration of motorcycling, whether it's electrics or whether it's three wheels mm -hmm. uh, in the form of a traditional sidecar or a and am style right. sidecar, or even the slingshots, I'm sorry, I had to say it. <laughs> um, we better be careful about shunning them too much. I know it's not a motorcycle. We all know that it has a <laughs> steering wheel. It ain't a motorcycle. If it looks but like the Batmobile, it's not Probably a not a motorcycle. <laughs> but neither do we want to exclude those people. Let's, you know, let's try to, the, the, the more we have, the louder our voice, the louder our voice, the yeah. more we're heard, the better we're going to be at protecting ourselves for the future. So, you know, if it's just a handful of us old guys that won't let any new guys come in, we don't want anything outside what we define as a motorcycle playing with us, uh, pretty soon we're going to be gone. Yeah. So all of these things are, are things that we have to be right. at least receptive to, and we don't have to love it, but we don't have to hate it either. So, you know, just try to be receptive, and the more of us can get along, the better, the more successful we'll be. Right. Aren't those the right words? Can't we all just get along? <laughs> I've heard that before, too. It'd be nice. It'd be nice. It's, uh, yeah, and it's funny because obviously doing my, my job, I get a chance to ride a little bit of everything. Speaking of which, what, what do you ride? What is your go-to? My primary ride right now is a 2013 FLHTP police motor. So it's a, it's a bagger, uh, but it was designed as a police motor. Okay. Okay. That's usually the very first question I always ask everybody is, what do you ride? And I, and I dawned on me, here we are all the way through here, and I hadn't even asked you that yet. Um, I don't even know what I was, where I was going well, at now. While you think of that, I, I remember, uh, I think we all probably remember getting our first bagger. You know, I thought, well, it'll be fun to have for trips and things like right. that. But, you know, if I had to win a bago, I wouldn't drive it to work every day. So <laughs> I'm not going to ride the bagger right. every day. Man, once you get something with a trunk or a tour pack, it is so convenient to just open it up and put stuff in there. And, you know, don't tell my biker friends, but I, I don't need the bugs in my teeth, my Tim. <laughs> I'm pretty comfortable with a, a bat wing fairing and a big windshield and uh, even some logers. You know, I've, I've gotten old and spoiled. Right. So, um, no, but I was saying, you know, I've got, I've, I've had the opportunity to ride a little bit of everything and I've rode electric motorcycles. And are they for me? 
No, for the style of writing I do. Um, actually, in all honesty, now they're starting to become a little bit more mm -hmm. in, the, in the style that I do. But just because it, it's not a bike for me doesn't mean I, it, it was a bad motorcycle. And that's what a lot of people come up to me. Oh, I know darn well they pay you, so you have to say it's good. That's like, well, first of all, I wish they paid me. Not one person. Still waiting on those checks. Yeah, aren't you? yeah. I haven't gotten one, let alone a residual. So, uh, well, They're amazing machines. Uh, they are. Um, I mean, they're not coming. They're here. Right. So it, it's here. It's now. Uh, there have been a lot of innovations. They've gotten uh, the electrics to where their performance is certainly there. I mean, oh yeah, boom! The torque, the power, and like a light switch, it, it's there. So yeah. the performance is there. The reliability is there. I mean, it's an electric motor. There's not a lot to go wrong with it. It's it's right. tight. Uh, price is getting closer. They're not crazy like they once were. So they're yeah. getting closer, and the more popular they become, the the less expensive they'll be. Range is still a bit of an issue, mm -hmm. and the Europeans have worked on uh, a good solution, especially for motorcycles. It doesn't really work with a a big car where you've got 2,000 pounds worth of battery. But um, if you're grilling on a Sunday afternoon and your grill runs out of propane, you grab your empty cylinder, run to the corner with 20 bucks and say, here's my empty and 20 bucks. Give me that full one. So rather than wait 45 minutes or three hours for a charge, right. you go to an energy station and you stop and say, hey, my battery's almost dead. Here's my old battery. Here's 20 bucks. Plug a new battery in. But they have to be interchangeable. And the mm -hmm. Europeans are working on that. Uh, we're a ways behind that. That that will help extend the range, yeah. not just in the range, but it makes it more doable. So it's uh, reasonable. You don't have to waste time recharging. So it, it's they're cool. They really are. And like you said, they're amazing to ride. They really are. Mm -hmm. The uh, I think the, the quietness is what scares me more than anything. It is. We, you know, we're already joking. We need to get some playing cards put in the spokes <laughs> yes. uh, so it makes some sort of exactly. noise. Exactly. But uh, that that is a concern uh, internationally about electric vehicles. With pedestrians, especially visually impaired pedestrians, if they make no noise, it, it is a, a potential hazard and safety issue. The one thing motorcycle They're all electric, visually oh, they impaired. Oh, they are. They are. <laughs> Everybody's the, visually impaired anymore. The, the one thing I think we'll all agree that um, electric motorcycles don't have, like I said, they've got the performance, the reliability, mm -hmm. uh, the cost is coming down, the range is, is getting there. They don't have a soul. So if <laughs> all you really want is a commuter to zip back and forth, yeah. it, 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 they're going to be great for that. Those of us that are the old guard, it's never going to have that. You don't, you don't smell it. You don't right. feel it. You don't hear it. Uh, it doesn't have the roar, the thunder, if you will, right. uh, that conventional motorcycles do. So that's the reason that much like with helmets, we, we don't hate helmets. We just don't want them forced on us. Uh, ethanol. We're not opposed to clean, renewable energy, independence of foreign oil, cheaper fuel. All those are good. We just don't want it forced on us, especially when it's not legal to put it in our vehicles yeah. uh, at greater than 10%. Same way with electrics. If people want to buy them, let them buy them, but don't mandate it to where it's a government subsidy that they're creating these things, yeah. and it's just phasing out the internal combustion engine so it's no longer an option. And those are the types of things we work on legislatively to try to get some protection for you know consumer choice mm -hmm. and that's my whole that's my my biggest thing that i stand for is freedom of choice and it's and that years ago when i used to work out this way and i'd go to lunch there was a place right here on the corner mm -hmm. that we used to go to lunch at and back in those days it was a smoke friendly place mm -hmm. you could smoke inside there and there were some people that didn't go because they're like oh i don't want to sit in there i'm a non-smoker mm -hmm. okay i don't i now i do smoke cigars uh but i mean as far as and back those back in those days, I was a non-smoker. I didn't smoke cigars. I didn't, I, you know, no cigarettes, none of that stuff. Hated going in there. And and still, as a cigar smoker, I still hate being around a bunch of people smoking cigarettes. It's just me. I don't like the smell of a cigarette. Love the smell of a cigar in a pipe. But anyway, going into there, it was like, you know, there were certain days it was like, you know, I really don't want to be in mm -hmm. there. And so I'd go to the pizza place instead. Um, but again, that was freedom of choice. It's like. I'm not paying their taxes. I'm not paying their mortgage. I'm not paying any of that stuff. Whoever's doing that, they have the right to choose to me. And so even as a non-smoker, I hated it when they started banning it. It was like, it's not your decision to make. It's the owner's decision to make. And if, if you don't want to work in that environment, you don't get a job there. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to eat in that environment, you don't eat there. It's like, And if you end up having no customers, 
he has to rethink his policy and, exactly. and, and change, go with the flow. But to just arbitrarily say, yes, this is going to be it. We don't care what anybody says or right. thinks. That's, that's not what we're about. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I love about what you guys do. Um, I want to make sure I know you got some stuff here. We want to take a look at here while we're here with you, but uh, let me just, let me just make sure I got everything down here. Um, oh, that, that was one thing I wanted to ask you. You mentioned about the 400 acre park in Lawrence mm -hmm. County is now, do you guys own that property or do you lease that property or do you we lease it for the boogie? Uh, but we lease it from a friendly group that owns it. Um, there's a, a corporation, Lawrence County Recreational Park, that actually owns that property. Okay. Uh, we work very closely with them. Gotcha. Gotcha. And how long have you guys been doing, doing the boogie down there? Since 2002 was our first one there. Okay. Last one in Bean Blossom was 2001. It is. It's hard to believe. That is really hard to believe. Because so I remember going to the last one in Bean Blossom and then going to the first one at the new place. Mm -hmm. And of course, like every other old person, you don't like change. So it's like, and, and again, Bean Blossom was convenient because you're in between, you know, Nash, little Nashville and, and stuff. So it was, it was kind of cool. But uh, I'll be honest, and, and over the years, the work that you guys have done down there, um, it's just, I mean, I tell people that all the time, you know, I'll talk to somebody about the boogie. And it's like, ah, it's a little too wild for me. You know, la, la, la. when's the last time you went? Well, I was down there Man, I used to go down there all the time back in the eighties, back in the nineties. It's like, okay, so you haven't been to the new property yet. We were no. literally camped on top of each other down there. That was my issue I had yeah. with Bean Blossom was it's too, it's too, cause I'll be honest. I, I probably had a tendency to lean a little more conservative than most people. So therefore I don't mind, again, I don't mind. You get the same Scott, no matter what Scott you get, whether it's Steel Horse Scott, whether it's Pastor Scott, whether it, you get the same one, you know. I'll be very upfront. I enjoy a cigar. I enjoy a cold beer. You know what I'm saying? But I have I have my line that I draw. And sometimes at the boogie, it it went, I mean, <laughs> it went really past my line. And in Bean you know, Blossom, there wasn't really much room to get no away from that. No way to get away from yeah. it. You, there was literally no escape from it. Whereas down at Lawrence County, on that property that you guys use down there, there is so much. And like you said, 400 acres. I mean, my God, there is. And, and I tell people all the time, I don't care where, if you've never been, enjoy the entire boogie. Do the whole thing, man. Make a lap through everywhere and, and just. Don't get, miss a piece of it because you may thing. really like that piece. Exactly. Yeah. Get, get, a, get a taste of the entire thing. And then you can decide what suits you better. And maybe you just want to go hang out and listen to music where the live bands are playing. Maybe you, you know, you'd rather be, you know, out riding some of the roads because my God, the roads out there are, are beautiful to ride. Nothing flat in Lawrence County. And, and, or maybe you do want just absolutely, guess what? I am going to get butt wild and I, I don't, I'm, when you get there, I'm going to take my clothes off and I ain't putting them on until it's time to leave. Whatever you want to do. And that's, that's to me, what I love about that place, again, freedom of choice. It's that whole freedom of choice. And of course, you have to be an adult to be down there. Um, and if that's not your bag, you go someplace else. you got another area to go to. With, with that much property, uh, we kind of have an entire community where we've got downtown, which is where the vendors and the food vendors and the mm -hmm. big tent and the music are, if you really want all that activity. And then we've got uh, the suburbs, which are Close by, but enough away that you don't have to be right in it. And then we've got the, the retirement community, if you will. <laughs> right. you know? So it's, it's a little something for everybody, and you can find what you want. And really about the only rule we have there is your good time can't interfere with somebody else's. So yeah. you know, if you step over to where you're bothering somebody else, we gotta, we got to do something about that. Mm -hmm. but as long as uh, you know, you're just having a good time and it's not bothering everybody, let your fleet free. Let your fleek flag fly. Fleek what flag, is it? Fleek flag fly. Whatever it is, you that's know, right. let your freak flag fly. That's it. Say that and, four <laughs> times. <laughs> but that's the thing. Down there, you can get out of it. You can get into it. Whatever you want. There, there's so much room down there. You know, when we filmed down there, um, we, we went around one spot, you know, and of course, you guys have always given us a golf cart to get around so we can film. And we get, you know, you get in some areas where all of a sudden you'll see somebody just got their tent tucked away in a little cove-like area, mm -hmm. and, you know, by the woods. And, and it's like, I, you know, and at one point, you know, I went by and it was just a couple and they were just sitting there just relaxing. And I was like, oh, man, we ought to go up there and, you know, find out, you know, 
I like to be a joker, right? So it's like, hey, did they put you in timeout? You know, what did you do to get, to, you know, to get banned? Why did, you know, do you have leprosy? Did they throw you out? We're trying to stay away from people like you. And then exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly, before we walked up, I was like, you know what? That's exactly what they don't want to hear. They don't want anything there. And I was like, I'm not going to ruin their time. They're having, this is what they came here to do. And I'm going to let them do and let them sit in the quietness of where they're at. And let them do whatever they're doing. It's like, you know, I'm not going to bother them at all. But it is something for everybody. Yes. You know, it's life isn't a one size fits all. Um, and there's, you know, there are some um, conservative type activities there where it's mm -hmm. just, you know, you can sit back and people watch. Um, you can get involved in some motorcycle competitions. You can get involved in some stupid human games, you know, if you right. want to. Uh, plenty of entertainment and shows to watch. Uh, contest competitions, just stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can you can sort of get away from that and be in just your own places that couple you found were, or um, you know, out in the the south field where it's a lot more quiet and you talk to your neighbors, but you're sitting around a campfire. And you can sort of hear the roar in the background, but it's right. not in your face. Yeah, so. yeah, and I know that the um, the uh, the boogie is your main fundraiser. Uh, I don't. I don't know if there's other fundraisers that you guys do throughout the year. I don't know. Where do you guys? I mean, do you guys get like? Do you have? All right. So do you got uh, like big pharma in your hip pocket? You got you got oil oil in your hip pocket. Is that where you guys are making all your money? You know those residual checks you keep waiting for. <laughs> yeah. we, we keep waiting for those big bags of cash still, too. Still they're, they're, they're not really there. <laughs> um, we are structured as a five one c three charitable not for profit organization. So by Indiana gaming laws we are allowed to participate in charitable gaming. Okay. So a lot of our revenue that funds the projects of the organization, the educational aspects, uh, comes from a, a bingo operation we have in Fort Wayne, Indiana, okay. uh, Coliseum Bingo. So we're, uh, we're in the, the bingo business. Nice. And that really helps uh, fund a lot of the projects uh, that, that we do. Um, the Boogie is a fundraiser. It hasn't been as big as it once was in generating a lot of money. Um, it's also a recruiting tool, if you will. You know, people come there because it's a good time and find out that we do a lot of things that are a good time and, and help bikers. So it helps get people uh, sort of introduced to the organization. I'm a boogie member. Uh, my first introduction to the organization uh, was in 1981, 82. 82. Uh, went to the boogie with some friends. And I wasn't a member at the time. And I just thought, yeah, this is all right, and the rest is history. Here I am. So um, each of our regions that we talked about, the 14 mm -hmm. regions, so we've got 14 regions and 92 counties in the state. Uh, we have a couple that are, like, combined uh, to, to make it worthwhile, but most of them have independent chapters in each of those counties, so 80-some-odd uh, county entities that we have. Okay. And they conduct events, uh, swap meets, rides, right. uh, you know, Halloween party, things like that. Chili Fest. And that Chili Fest, absolutely. I should have thought of that <laughs> knowing where you're from. Um, things like that that generate funds as well. And they donate that to the organization, all generated in the interest of okay. taking care of our legislative activity, helping us with the other philanthropic activities so we can help out others, and funding uh, awareness campaigns, uh, helping to support our writer education program. It's mostly self-funded, um, the writer education by student tuition and uh, subsidies created by the fees we pay as motorcyclists on our registrations. Mm -hmm. So every motorcyclist in the state on their license plate, $7 of what they pay every year goes into a fund for rider education. And that helps okay. supplement the state, then divvies that out, and it helps supplement the cost of training people to ride. Okay. Well, see, now I won't feel quite as bad when I see how much they're charging me to plate my 20-year-old. <laughs> Seven dollars that goes into rider education. You can feel good about that. I Seven. Do. I'm going to feel fantastic <laughs> about that now. That That's great. Yeah, because I was wondering, I mean, it's like, you know, and I know, you know, you're going to pay, you know, uh, uh, annual dues to be a member. And you know, what does it take to become a member of ABA? It is still the least expensive membership in my wallet. And I belong to a lot of organizations. We're $25 a year membership. Still? Yeah. And uh, so you get a monthly magazine, wow. and it's Hoosier Motorcyclist. We're quite proud of. It's a substantial magazine. Um, has a lot of our events and what's going on, but uh, there's also a lot of content, some useful information in there. So it's, uh, it's, it's a valid publication and, and certainly a membership benefit. 
Uh, we have our legal services program, which uh, I don't know. I think even if you go on like LegalZoom online or whatever to draft a simple will, it still costs you 50, 75 bucks. Right. Uh, as a member of Abate of Indiana, you have access to the legal services program and you can get a free simple will, uh, no cost, no charge. Uh, huh. We have uh, accidental. Because at my age, that's pretty important. Oh, it is. It is. And so many of our people don't do that, Scott. And it's, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And it just creates, it truly adds insult to injury in those times oh, when yeah. the family doesn't want to have to deal with that. And it, yeah. a lot of things don't get to take care of the way they should. So as a member, call legal services and have them get you at least a simple will so things are in place. And that way you don't have to leave it up to the state and everything. Right. And you know that certain things are going to be the way they should be. Um, through uh, American Income Life, we've got a no-cost uh, accidental death and dismemberment benefit. So if you're a member in good standing and you uh, are killed in some sort of accident, or if you uh, are dismembered, you lose a digit, you lose a hand, you lose the use of an eye, uh, there are benefits paid for that. Uh, $3,500, which isn't huge money in today's society, but uh, again, in those times when these families are struggling oh, yeah. and suffering, the last thing they need is to worry about having to try to take care of some of the arrangements. Right. 3500 bucks goes a long way to yeah. help that. Yeah, it does. So there are a, a number of benefits to, to membership um, that our, our members have access to and knowing that you're doing good stuff. You know, Protecting mm -hmm. and promoting motorcycling for future generations is really our, our mission. That's amazing. I, I'm just shocked that it's, it's, it's still 25 because, you know, and, and that's something uh, Cindy and I actually talked about. And I was like, you know, because I, I was like you, I was a member of everything for a long, long time. And then I don't know what happened. And it kind of like like now it's been it's been a few years since I've been a member with a bait. We can fix that so, before you leave here today. And I, that's what I, <laughs> that's what I want to know, only because I know I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only person that was a member for many, 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 many years, and then all of a sudden stopped, and now no longer a member. How do you how if you're like, man, I don't know why I let this lapse, or maybe it was that hiatus where you weren't on a motorcycle again. You know what I mean? And then you decide, hey, I'm riding again. I want to get back on a motorcycle again. How does a person reapply? I'm Is glad you brought that different? up because, boy, we really need the support now. We really do. Um, I think every membership-based organization is struggling. You know, we talk to folks at uh, American Legion Post, uh, people mm -hmm. that run volunteer fire departments, and they just can't get people to participate and keep things going. Uh, school PTA, you know, nobody wants to do anything. So we're really fighting for membership right now, and we need that support, not just financially to keep the organization going. We need those numbers because, as we keep saying, the more people, the louder our voice, the better we're heard. Right. So if you know we represent ten people and we go to the state house, well, thanks for telling us, but we got another ten people over here. If we represent ten thousand people, that means a lot more. And if you mm -hmm. have a hundred thousand people, that's a true voting block. You can influence a lot of legislation in with numbers like that. Yeah. So we really need the support right now uh, based on the, the challenges and threats that I told you earlier that motorcycling is and will be facing. And it's so easy to get involved. You don't have to have a motorcycle. Um, certainly most of our people do, and you know we, we are motorcyclists, mm -hmm. but you can be a member without owning a motorcycle or ever having ridden one. If you share our you know philosophies and right. uh, our spirit, um, 25 bucks, go online. Uh, abateonline.org uh, will get you to our website and you can do it all online with a credit card. Don't have to do no muss, no fuss, real easy. Oh, wow. Okay. Cause I definitely want to do that. There, there were, there are some organizations I probably won't re up on, but this one here, I I've always, I've just always been such a adamant supporter of you guys. Uh, again, for me, it was mostly the, the rider rider safety course. <laughs> that was a Bates riders course is what, we always say, I mean, I remember back in the day, man, at the when we'd have the expo. And you, if you got there at 11 o'clock in the morning, that line was already out the door and around the building in the middle of February. <laughs> like a Who concert. <laughs> yes, mm. it was. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's just, that's just one of the, this is one of the organizations I, I truly always liked being a member of. And uh, we certainly appreciate it. Heck. Appreciate all you've done. Wesley, uh, cameraman Wes, you got anything you have for Jay before we go take a look? I know he's got a few things back there I wanted to take a look at while we had the cameras rolling. You got anything for Jay? Um, no, I don't think so. 
No. No. He answered all your questions. He did. <laughs> he's got no produce over there to throw. We're, <laughs> we're in good shape. No. no. Well, well, he's done this for 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 a couple of years now. So I think uh, you know, Jay, you got you you kind of got it under control. You kind of know what you're doing here. Um, we've got some great folks. Uh, it is a team effort, and we've got some wonderful people uh, mm -hmm. here in the office, as well as our board of directors and uh, the the officers throughout the state, and certainly the membership. Uh, yeah. plays a strong role in that. So we've got some great folks. All right. Well, I know you got a couple of things out in, in the other room. Uh, we do. Why don't we, why don't we uh, get a drink and then head back there and take a look at some of your stuff? That'd be great. All right. Many of the people in that photo are dead. I, probably the only person you might recognize is Balls. Um, and some yeah, landmark right. events and some national stuff that has happened. Um, do you know who this is? I think that is Penny. Where was she from? Um, she almost looks familiar. I'm trying to remember where she was from. Southern State. Yeah, there because there's uh, uh, Rob Razor, who became president of the American Motorcyclist Association. So when would that have been taken? Right there. Mid '80s. Mid '80s doesn't seem like it was that long ago, because <laughs> we were there, right? It, it doesn't seem like a long time ago, but when you start counting, it's like, dang. Well, I'm not kidding. I'm 35. So I don't know how old you are, but I'm 35. Right. Right. Well, if you're 35, then I got to be 30. <laughs> what did I say? 37. Two? I thought Two. I thought I was 32 last time because you were only 30. Ah. Uh. So this is, this is the beginnings right here. Of the national movement. Uh, our movement in the state was a little ahead of this. Um, I mentioned the, the first meeting of the minds, the gathering, the discussion, uh -huh. the networking meeting in St. Louis. That was what prompted this. And the okay. meeting was so productive, they said, you know, we need, to, we need to formalize this. We need to do something with this, make it a little more regular, a little more structured. And that was the start of the... If you look at the patch, originally, it would have started out as the Motorcycle Rights Fund and then became the uh, Motorcycle Riders Foundation shortly thereafter. Ah. And then over here? Those are people that have been inducted into the Motorcycle Riders Foundation Hall of Fame for various uh, activities, many of them at the state level in the serving riders in their own state, uh, but also many of them uh, had federal activity. Mm -hmm. Sherm Packard is one of our greatest success stories. Been involved in the motorcyclist rights movement uh, forever in the state of New Hampshire and decided that uh, lobbying for us wasn't good enough and he actually ran for elected office and he is now the Speaker of the House of the New Hampshire General Assembly. Wow. Wow. And is he up there? Surely he is somewhere. Uh, Bob Letourneau. I think Bob Letourneau has been inducted. If not, I think he's about to be. Uh, same state, New Hampshire, live free or die. Uh, Bob Letourneau, we call him Radio Bob. He um, ran for the house. Sherman originally uh, ran for the house and has stayed there and, like I said, ascended to speaker. Uh, Bob ran for the House and then jump ship went over to the Senate. And so at one time we had the chairman of the House Transportation Committee and the Senate Transportation Committee as being avid motorcyclist rights hmm. advocates. Well, now I see you have also made it into the Hall of Fame. I am so there now, as well. Now I'm suspicious yep. about you being 35. <laughs> <laughs> I was, You're obviously the youngest. I was, yeah, I was aggressive. Yeah, I started out early, worked hard. <laughs> now this is super cool, man. Looking at this stuff on the wall and everything else. I absolutely love it. Now you guys... Down at the property, I know there is a, a motorcycles memorial. Um, uh, what exactly is that? The title is the Indiana Motorcycle Safety Memorial. Okay. That's the big rock in the middle. 
Okay. And that uh, is made of the same vein of stone that the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is made of. Okay. Uh, Jim Yaney spearheaded that project. He was a motorcycle safety instructor and site coordinator of ours in Muncie for a number of years. I remember him. I, and, remember, I, I remember him. I remember that name and everything else. Yeah. And uh, Mike Smith and he went through the same instructor preparation class together. And uh, Mike ended up uh, passing away and Jim wanted to recognize that and thought we ought to have something to memorialize instructors. So he went out and got the funding for that. I think most of it from Benson's and yeah. uh, the, the, I think it's 1280s, the hog chapter over in Muncie, uh, got the funding and the support and made it all happen. And the intent with the shape of that is that there could be walkways in each direction off of there. So motorcycle safety is in the center and that's motorcycle safety instructors. Um, the women in motorcycling has a nice metallic uh, sculpture there now and so women that have made a significant okay. achievement in motorcycling are recognized on that path uh, the intent provided for competition so like racing uh, industry uh, dealers and I think legislation each oh, of those wow. but women in motorcycling is the other one that's actually been developed uh, to this point I'll be I'll be I, you know it's been it's been so long since I've been there well you have to check it out in July I definitely definitely will check it out the uh, pavers and the walkway that lead up to there um, can be people just showing support. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you don't have to have passed to have your name there, but a lot of people do recognize friends or family that have right. passed with a, a paver. And we have very few blank pavers now. Yeah. The walkway is filled in pretty well. Well, I know Steve Reeves has a, has a, he has a, a brick down there. Absolutely. Um, you know, Steve Reeves, the original, the original host of the show, Steel Horse. Actually, if we go this way, I think he and Angela, Hey, look there at the bottom. There's Steve. There we go. Steve and Angela, the originals. Yeah, we've had a lot of fun through the years. Um, meeting people like you and uh, Wes and Cindy and Steve and Angela. Uh, you see the Indianapolis Colts there. Uh, we had the opportunity during the Super Bowl era to work with, uh, oh, I'll bet we had a couple of dozen probably maybe close to 30 Colts that we worked with mm -hmm. in rider education, including the entire offensive line. Right. Uh, Howard Mudd, of course, was a dear friend, uh, offensive line coach, and so he put most of his boys through the, the rider education program. Jeff Saturday, and, say, you know, know all, all those Jeff folks. and, and uh, Tar Glenn. And yeah, and you see uh, Tarek right there and Deem on the end. I think Jeff Saturday once referred to him as a circus freak. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rick DeMulling, I think, is in there as well. You see him on TV a little bit now doing right. some commercials. Right. Now, I talked to Jeff Saturday one time, and we, we were talking, and uh, I think it was at his burn camp that he, mm -hmm. he used to sponsor. And we, we just got talking. I was like, dude, how do I get some of these new players to come out and ride? And he just started laughing. He goes, dude, they don't ride. <laughs> he goes, those kids, they don't go outside. They no. stay inside and play video games. That's it. That is it. This is really cool out here. And this man. probably won't show up well because it's pretty shiny, but um, this is an event that took place in 1909. That's on Monument Circle in Indianapolis. You can see the church oh, over wow. on the right. So you're looking uh, north on Meridian Street right here huh. uh, from the circle. And this was an event that took place out at the Speedway, the Motor Speedway in 1909. So do the math, you know, when they're centennial, centennial right. era, this is one of the first events out there. A motorcycle event. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that Indianapolis Motor Speedway that 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 was literally that was motorcycles were the first thing going around that track. Yeah, I remember when they brought the Moto GP here back. Yeah, I guess it's been a while now. Well, we've got some uh, things over here from Moto GP, and if you remember, uh, Nicky Hayden uh, was big in the promotion of that since he was. Yep. Uh, well, he was just coming off a world championship about the time we mm -hmm. uh, had ho started hosting MotoGP at the Speedway. And he's from Kentucky, so right. he was sort of a local guy. And you see him on one of the bikes out in the museum right there at the top left. That was when they were doing a promotion uh, to announce that MotoGP was coming. Uh, so they put him in old gear on an old bike and had him take a couple laps around the track. I have a really cool poster, and it was... There's very few of them made. I, I just happened to know the lady that was in charge of the, the artwork for this thing. And it was for the, for the inaugural because it, it, it had the little logo there, you know, mm -hmm. on, at the bottom. 
but it's like in the forefront, it is the first motorcycle that ever ran. And then it kind of fades in the back to eventually you have Nicky Hayden in the back on his bike. And it, it's just a really cool thing. And, and there was only a few of them made. And she was like, I got two left and she gave them to <laughs> you me. You got lucky somehow. So I got one. Good clean living, right? I got, one, I got one of them and I brought one to, um, oh, um, Hot Rod Harley Davidson up in, Oh, Muskegon, <laughs> Muskegon. They do a Muskegon bike time. Actually, it's about the same time as the boogie takes place. Um, I think it's, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's the same weekend. Uh, I was working with Bubba Blackwell. We did that event. So he did a big jump up there. So we did it two years in a row, got to know the owner there really well. Um, this was right after I lost my oldest son to, to suicide. Well, the owner he had lost his son. He raced and, and he, he got killed down at Daytona on the track. And so it just became that, you know, we had that common bond that, you know, the one you don't ever want to have, but you have it. And I just remember Cindy and I, we worked an event with Bubba. I think it was the Harley's 105th, whatever, up in Milwaukee. We had four nights or four days, different places. And after that, we, we were on our bikes. We took off and we rode the whole North Shore Lake Superior. Coming back, we ended up going down through Muskegon, stopped in to say hi. And he goes, man, next weekend's the the, the GP. I'll see you. I'll be in Indianapolis. You know, it's going to be a week or two later or whatever. And uh, I was like, ah, I said, man, I said, we've been on the road for 10 days. I said, we pretty much blew our wad out here. We don't have any more money left. He goes, you're not going? I said, dude, I just pick and choose. And I could only, this is, this is what we Got chose to do. He goes, hang on a second. He goes out to his car, comes back in, and he hands me two weekend passes. You know, we had seats in the stands if we wanted them, which we didn't. We'd rather sit on the grass and be right by the track. But we got to spend the entire weekend there. So the next year, we went back up for bike time. I brought that second one that I had because mm. he was such a big fan and his son was racing, you know, the GP and all so that. So it was a real, it was a fit. So it was like, man, this is exactly who deserves to have this other one. So, and I mean, he was in tears when he got it. It was just, I mean, so yeah, yeah, the little things. You know, I, I haven't gotten the big checks from, you know, Big Pharma or anything. People but do. it all works out here. But yeah. I've had some pretty cool experiences, and that's what it's really all about. The uh, Hurt Report that you may or may not heard of, uh, Dr. Harry Hurt, you heard, out of uh, California, the University of Southern California, uh, performed the most extensive motorcycle safety research test ever. There was a crash analysis. So they went and investigated just short of a 1,000 crashes uh, in Los Angeles County and uh, over the course of, I think it was nine, 10 months. So, I mean, they responded on everything, made uh, meticulous notes about the circumstances and what happened. And from that, they put together the basis for the first uh, fact-based curriculum of motorcycle safety. You know, why do motorcycles crash? Here's what happens. Here's what, what went wrong. How do we avoid that? And so that's, uh, that's the basis for that. And that's Wow. Motorcycle safety history. Then mm -mm -mm -mm. there, that was our original mobile training unit up there. That was in 1987. Wow. Then that's the memorial right there. Is that it is it. Okay. And then our founder of Bay of Indiana was actually created by a woman, believe it or not. Uh, in the 1970s, women in motorcycling, especially the club culture, were not terribly well respected. Right. And so she had a lot to overcome uh, to be as successful as she was. And it's an incredible story. She's actually got a book, uh, I Volunteered for What? Uh, you ought to, you ought to <laughs> check it out sometime. So it's a pretty good story of how it all happened. Huh. Uh, that was her helmet with the mock DOT sticker on it. So she can challenge that. <laughs> nice. I spoke about the uh, Colts. Uh, that's the Super Bowl. Colts team signed on a motorcycle Colts helmet. It's not that's, a football that's, helmet. That's that was kind of cool. unique. That's pretty cool. Uh, that's very cool. That's Governor cool. Daniel's helmet. And I could make up some rumor that Peter Fonda actually wore that helmet, but he, it is just a... Oh, no, I'm pretty It's sure a Captain did. America knockoff <laughs> helmet, I, I'm afraid. <laughs> and who gets to park the bike right here? Is this, is this for your parking spot when you come yeah, in? Sure, sure. You know, we'd like to keep it warm and, and comfy. <laughs> Uh, this uh, motorcycle was actually donated to us by Gino Johnson, uh, who you know from the, the Miracle Ride. Um, it was a friend of ours, uh, Robin Smith, Robo. Uh, 
uh, it was unfortunately uh, it was a huge supporter of the organization, uh, was a regular boogie attender, and unfortunately, uh, about I think it was about a month after the boogie, uh, was killed in Indianapolis. So mm. Gino ended up with his bike and couldn't uh, bear to part with it. And so we've got it on display here just as an artifact of a, a basic custom motorcycle. Right. Very nice. And this one, of course, is a training motorcycle. Uh, early 90s Honda CB125. Uh, the T was for trainer. So Honda made these specifically for rider education. They didn't meet the emission standards necessary for import to the country. So they imported them specifically for rider training with the uh, stipulation that when they were done, uh, they would have to be destroyed or something so they could not be used on the street. So they were never designed for street use. The uh, light bar, boy, back in the 90s, I think I could tell you what they all were, Scott, but there's a lot going on there. But from the, there's one on the front and the back, so the instructor could tell from a distance even if the bike was in neutral, green light would be on, um, if it was in first gear versus third gear, uh, one of the lights flashed once you got over 15 miles per hour. Uh, the, the reds were for like brake lights, so either from the front or back, you could tell that the other was being used as mm -hmm. well. So it was, it was a great idea, but it was a lot going on. A lot. Uh, it was a lot. I'm not sure, and they, they didn't always work quite right. But it was a great training bike. These things are bulletproof. Now, what do you guys use? Now, do you use a mixture of... Yeah, the, the fleet varies a little bit. Okay. Uh, we don't have anything in our fleet over 250 cc's. Uh, for okay. an entry-level training course, we feel that's the best size. Um, it's hard to find an entry-level bike now. You know, manufacturers right. aren't really selling a lot of them, so they don't manufacture a lot of them. They're mm -hmm. not that popular. So th we have a number of cruisers, Honda Rebels. I was going to say the Rebels. The little Viragos, that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it works real well. Uh, but we prefer a standard upright, you know, not cruise or foot forward or anything. And they're even more hard to find. But yeah. we've still got some uh, Honda Nighthawks that work really okay. well. Um, we don't have we don't have any of these in don't service any anymore. No. Well, these are these are just in the museum now. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what Cindy rode, but uh, that was her first bike was a Honda Rebel. You know, we went down to great starter. Went to Bloomington, Indiana, and, and found one down there for whatever. 700 bucks it was an old 80 i think it's an 82 or an 83 was it the 250 she uh, started on 250 mm -hmm. dude she put she put like almost twenty thousand miles on that motorcycle she'd ride it on a, on a weekend we'd go do 1200 1500 miles on a weekend or whatever you know where we'd run down to tennessee or whatever and come back she did all that on the, on the rebel i mean i had a buddy of mine he used to say it all the time he said, dear god if we ever put her on a real motorcycle you're not gonna be able us, to keep up with none her. of us will keep up with her and you know, she rode that 250 for, for quite a while. And then, like I said, she, she bumped up to a, a Buells when mm -hmm. the Buells had their, their blast, those mm -hmm. 500s. Put her on one of those. And, I mean, she put, gosh, close to 50,000 miles mm -hmm. on that in just a few years now, too, mm -hmm. mind you. This is just a few years. And then she started riding in 2000. And in 08, I bought her the, the Dyna that she's still riding today. Um, so in those first eight years, you know, she had already had Close, lots close of experience and lots of miles. miles yeah. So it's like, it was, uh, you know, she, she was a very, very good, you know, she got a lot of, she just fell in love with it after the course. Cause she but was it's, it's a great confidence building bike too. Cause you can get really comfortable on it, gain a lot of experience. That was, and, and that's my recommendation to everybody. Everybody's like, no, just get on the bike. You plan on riding. Mm -hmm. I was like, I've watched too many people do that. Men and women. I'm not talking about just ladies. I'm talking men and women. They get on a bike that's bigger than what they want. And also in that confidence they had, it just vanishes because it can. now it's like, oh no. And so to me, I'm like, man, there's nothing wrong with starting off smaller and working your way up and, and getting to what you finally realize, hey, this Something is look what forward I enjoy to. doing. This is the way I like to ride. Now I know what kind of bike I really mm -hmm. want. And, you know, she can ride in the Dyna since 08, so she's not complaining about that. That must be that. the one she wants. <laughs> so. Well, Jay, thank you so much for taking time. Doing thank you this, all. Man. It was Always good. great to see you. This was kind of fun being able to come out here and be somewhere different and uh, being able to talk with you. It's always a pleasure. Uh, one more time, real quick, the boogie this year. The dates, do you remember the dates? Boogie is always the third weekend, third full weekend in July. So this year it'll start on the 18th through the 21st. And that's at uh, uh, Lawrence County Recreational Park down in uh, Spring, Spring Burton. No, geez. What is it? 
Springville. Springville. I don't know why I was wanting to go to Springboro. I wanted to go I, to Spring just Mill. jumped in my mind. <laughs> Springville. I know yeah. where it is. I, I'm telling you, it's that COVID yeah, old you. guy thing right. again. But uh, yeah, the 18th through the 21st at uh, okay. LCRP down in Springville. And if you can't find Springville, just look for popcorn in the end. <laughs> You'll find it. Even easier. Just follow the motorcycles. You'll get there. <laughs> exactly. Call us. Uh, exactly. Abateonline.org or 1-800-23-ABATE. You'll get a hold of us. Right on. All right. Well, we'll definitely be seeing you down there. Looking forward to and, it. And uh, thank you so much, man, for taking the time. Thanks, Scott. Like